fantastic. Talk is about alpha zero. You probably heard all about it and I actually want to start with a quick hooray with a quick video and then we will go through what does reinforcement learning basically mean, what is alpha zero and a quick outlook to how does it work. No, actually an in-depth outlook on how does it work and what else might be interesting in the sphere of reinforcement learning. To set the stage, let's listen to David Silver, the guy from Google DeepMind who basically is a, is a father of all this work. And I hope you can understand it if I connect this here. Let's see. Do you hear anything? No. Why don't you hear? Let's start again. That's always the thing if you want to videotape something, it doesn't work then. AlphaGo Zero is the strongest Go program in the world. It outperformed all previous versions of AlphaGo. Specifically, it defeated the version of AlphaGo that won against the world champion Lisa Doll and it beat that version of AlphaGo by 100 games to zero. So all previous versions of AlphaGo started by training from human data. And they were told, well, in this position, the human expert played this particular move, and in this other position, the human expert played here. AlphaGo Zero doesn't use any human data whatsoever. Instead, what it has to do is learn for itself, completely from self-play. So the reason that playing against itself enables it to do so much better than using strong human data is that First of all, AlphaGo always has an opponent at just the right level. So it starts off extremely naive, it starts off with completely random play. And yet, at every step of the learning process, it has an opponent, a sparring partner if you like, that's exactly calibrated to its current level of performance. And to begin with, these players are very, very weak, but over time they become progressively stronger and stronger and stronger. People tend to assume that machine learning is all about big data and massive amounts of computation. But actually what we saw in AlphaGo Zero is that algorithms matter much more than either compute or uh, data availability. In fact, in AlphaGo Zero, we use more than an order of magnitude less computation than we used in previous versions of AlphaGo, and yet it was able to perform at a much higher level due to using much more principled algorithms than we had before. I think uh, I can speak for the team by saying that we were all pleasantly surprised by just how far it went, that eventually it was able to surpass all of our expectations, and it was able to actually climb up the ratings until after around 40 days we found that it had actually defeated all previous versions of AlphaGo to become the strongest Go program in the world. And this is all for a system that's been trained completely from scratch, starting from random behavior and progressing from first principles to really discover tabula rasa how to play the game of Go. So I hope you're excited a little. I certainly am. Um, my guarantee to you is if you know the slightest bit of machine learning, you will in the end fully understand how it works. It's so, it's amazingly easy. Um, very, very fantastic work and um, you will understand how it works in the end of this hour. So let's go quickly into what is learning to act? What is reinforcement learning? Sorry. Yeah, here we go. Um, so you've probably seen a figure like that before. Reinforcement learning is a setting where our agent, whatever program software that is, has to interact with an environment, a game, the real world, whatever, a simulation. It gets observations from this environment per time step and is meant to, to issue some actions, to move an, uh, to move an actuator, to, to, to trigger some, some activity. And sometimes it will receive a reward. It will always receive a reward, but usually the reward will be zero. And for example, in Go, you only receive the reward at the end of the game where you will know if you have won or lost. So this is the setting. Per time step an observation, per time step something you have to do, and sometimes you get a reward, and we have to learn how to act optimally in such an environment. This is reinforcement learning. Um, this is how the machine learning guys call it. 
there are similar fields in different fields of study that tackle the same kind of problem. You have it in operations research, where you tackle it with dynamic programming. You have it in neuroscience and psychology. Optimal control is, of course, a mechanical engineering issue, an electrical engineering issue. The characteristics are you don't have a supervision, a strong supervision, like in supervised learning, where you get an example and you tell it, hey, on this picture I see a face, I see a dog, I see whatever. Here, you get observations, you have to act, and sometimes you receive sparsely, you receive supervision in terms of a reward. So the feedback is delayed. There's a trade-off between you have to explore what works well and to exploit what you already know that works well. And when you only exploit, you know what the result will be, but you never know how to get better. You never learn. And it's a sequential decision process. So what you act here is likely to change the observations you get. Like when I'm trying learning to walk and I stumble over my own field, I will not anymore see the wall, I will see the ground because I'm flat. So it's a sequential decision-making problem um, that means your samples are highly correlated with each other. So you cannot just take a supervised learning approach, usually. So that's reinforcement learning in a nut nutshell. That's the problem setting. And we will see a specific approach to it today. Um, where can you apply it? Um, actually, I was creating that slide a couple of months ago, and since then um, there appeared a meetup group meeting in Zurich for the first time, I think in two weeks, or next, next week already, um, on applied reinforcement learning. It's completely booked out already. I wanted to take part in it, and I'm on the waiting list because 60 people already go. Most of them not from academia, but from companies. So, uh, except... I will not read the list to you. You already did that, probably. I just want to say, I think reinforcement learning is one of the next things that we will see applied in practice. Not at every case already, but at selected cases where some ca one can show that it works well. I think reinforcement learning is at the, at the brink of where it really goes into practice. And it's not just game playing and not just robotics. We are currently actually having a couple of projects with reinforcement learning methodology on completely not mechanical movement kind of, kind of problems and not games. So it's a very interesting thing to learn about it. Let's look at an example. And the example will be the Alpha Zero system from Google DeepMind that we just heard about from David Silver. I'm not sure how it is with you. I'm, I wasn't familiar with the game of Go before I started reading the paper. So I thought a little introduction might be helpful. And it's actually simpler than I thought. Uh, it's like chess, much more complex, but much more simple in terms of the rules. So what do we have? It's a perfect information game like chess. We always know all the information. We look at the board and everything we need to know about the state of the, of the environment of the game is on the, seen on the board here with the, with the stones on this board. Um, it's deterministic, absolutely no, uh, no non-determinism, no uh, randomness, no randomness in it. Uh, it's a two-player game, it's turn-based. When it's my turn, I can think. When I'm ready, I do a move. Then it's time of the opponent. So there's no time stress usually. And it's a zero-sum game. If I win, the other loses. If the other wins, I lose. There's no tie state, like in chess. One player wins and the other loses. Uh, it's played usually on a 19 times 19 board, but for um, pra practical reasons, if you want to practice, uh, it can be smaller. Um, what else? It has been considered a grand challenge for AI because the search st space for optimal play is huge. This is a search space for, for chess. Chess was a grand challenge in the 90s. Go was a grand challenge in this decade. And actually, people thought it will be the grand challenge of the next decade. Actually, everybody was surprised that it works. So we'll see how they made it work. What are the rules of the game? So at each turn, a player puts a stone at an intersection here of, of these, not inside of such a field, at the intersection, on the lines. And, or, or it says, oh, I cannot move or don't want to move, I pass. Then it's the turn of the other player again. Now, if a connected group or a single stone of one color is completely and fully surrounded by stones of the other color, this connected group or single stone that is surrounded will be removed from the board. So this is how you can capture stones of the enemy, if you surround them. Um, and also, it's 
forbidden to recreate a board position that has been there before. So if the only move you can make will bring you in a position that has been there an hour ago, um, you cannot move, you have to pass. And this actually is how the game ends. If you pass two consecutive times in a row, the game is over and um, it is counted how, many, how, how much area you have on the board. Um, and the one with more area on the board wins. So that's the game of Go. Pretty simple rules, pretty complex gameplay. Google DeepMind actually did a full line of research on that. And it actually dates back to before the foundation of the company when the main researchers on the project were already doing this kind of stuff when they were still uh, PhD students and, and, and postdocs. Yes? So you said that the one position is allowed to be only for one specific time. Yes. How, how do you manage that? Do you have to remember each position that was already there? Or? I actually have no idea how they, how they do it. I never played it yet. Um, I guess in the professional games, they have somehow a, a referee that is watching for that. And I guess it m m must be able, you, you must be able somehow to, to see these kind of things. You know? Yes, it's usually alternating positions uh, on the board where this rule applies. So. Ah, okay. And, uh, but you have to somehow detect them and say, oh, we already had that. Ah, and back and forth, that's, that's what is forbidden. Okay. I don't know, maybe the rule is like this, but usually it's, it's, it's applied if you see this alternative. Okay, so you're, the, the next day state is not allowed to be the, state, the, the last or the second last state. Okay. Yeah, that makes it easier. I mean, if you, difficult to remember stuff from an hour ago. Thank you. So the first thing that was published on that like that was a huge success and made it to the to the title of Nature and to all the news, I think even to the to the TV news was the system called AlphaGo, that uh, um, was uh, that beat the the human world champion, um, I think five five to one four to one like quite decisive, um, which wasn't thought of possible before. This was in 2016. Um, later on. They created the system we will talk about today, Alpha Zero, not Alpha Go, Alpha Zero, which is a simplification actually of the system that works much better. Simpler algorithms. What do I have here? Better playing strength, higher generality. They expressed it in a third article that is not out yet, but lay out it like a nature article, so probably it's it's going to be published in nature as well. It shows that the same algorithm works also for chess and for the uh, Japanese version of chess called Shogi. Um, and the complexity went down from here to here. The algorithms got always simpler and better comprehensible and, and that's fantastic. You do not see that very often in research, um, that things get simpler concept-wise. Um, and for me, that is a very strong point for that there's really the discovery behind that, that it might be applicable elsewhere, not, not just for these kind of games. Good. So let's go into it. We will now somehow try to uncover the details of the system. So maybe we start with the goal. What, what's the goal of the system? The goal is to have a policy. What is a policy? The policy is the real thing, while the, the sketch of the brain here is just to, to look very fancy. So the policy is basically a function that takes a state, the observation basically, um, and issues the next action based on the state. So the policy is a function that maps from state to action. How do you represent that? I mean, in the mathematical sense, it's a function. You can do it with function approximation, with a neural network, whatever. But in the end, it's mathematically a function. And this needs to be learned. And in reinforcement learning, we call this function a policy, mapping from states to actions. Um, if we have the optimal policy, we usually call the policy pi and the optimal policy pi star, um, then it's, we can prove that it's, um, or one can prove, that it's possible to act optimally in the environment, basically that, that we can play optimally, which is of course a very strong thing. Um, so how can we achieve that? We can plug in here for that brain-like placeholder, something like a neural network that will take in board positions, maybe in form of, of pixel values, like a game or something, uh, like, like an image, 
and we can have something like a neural network that in the end outputs probabilities for each possible action. Like the possible actions are taking a stone and putting it at every possible po position. And this thing can be treated like a black box that can be trained using machine learning techniques. That's one possibility. Um, now it's the case that training function approximators directly for reinforcement learning is somehow a, a difficult thing. It can be unstable, um, the, the, um, how, how it behaves can be not so nice, so it's difficult. Especially in a game where it's all about strategy, like not making the, the next immediate capture and the next move, but thinking ahead a couple of, of moves, maybe tenths of, move, tenths of moves, um, in order to, to somehow trap the enemy, the, the other player, the opponent, not enemy. Um, so in the AI course, for those of you that, that are taking the class, we started with a very simple approach to AI called search that was able to do look-aheads. And actually, what AlphaZero is about is to combine the strength of function approximators that can take in the whole board and issue a probability for, for an action <coughs> with look-ahead search to basically get a better understanding of the immediate next steps and get a better feeling for what might be a good tactic. So while the neural network is something like your gut feeling of what is overall a good thing, combining it with look-ahead search will give you better tactic like short to medium term strategic behavior. And that might look like that. You're in the current position and then you try what happens if I do this? From there, what happens if I do something else? And if you focus on those positions that end up well for you, you will find out a path that is very likely to lead you to success and then you choose this action over others. So that's basically the overall idea. Combine function approximators for the policy with look-ahead search in a very simple way. You're not yet to understand it. You will in the next 20 minutes. So if, if I look one step ahead and I move a stone, then the, the other person can do Whatever. many different moves. Mm -hmm. so yes, exactly. It will have a huge, uh, the AI guys call it a branching factor. Mm -hmm. So you can maybe do 100 different actions. In each one you do, 100 possible actions might follow. In each one of those, 100 possible actions might follow. So there's a huge explosion of the search space. This is why it wasn't thought possible to do it before by just the search. Of course, the search is theoretically, it will lead to an optimal result, but you cannot compute it. So this is how you can combine the neural network and the search idea to make it computationally feasible. By using the neural network to guide you by some sort of gut feeling which path from these hundreds of possibilities you do not have to follow because they will not lead to something interesting. Th that will be the overall idea. Sh shall we go on from there? It's okay to be a little bit confused at the moment. It will become, cl it will become clear. Uh, is the policy meant to be deterministic there? I mean, the way it's written like P and then brackets, is it like a probability or something conditional on something else? Or is it just a condition, like you said? Is it a deterministic policy or is it... In the end, it, sh it will play deterministically in production, like when you're really playing against the world champion, it will play deterministically. Um, during training, it is uh, probabilistic. So it's, it's a distribution over actions. Yes? Is the same neural network used in, at all depths of the game tree? Or? Yes. But we, we, we will see exactly these kind of things in, in a couple of, of seconds. That's just the overarching idea. Neural networks plus tree search. Let's see how it works. So for, a mo for the moment, let's assume we have such a policy encoded in your network. We will see later how to train it. Let's assume we have it. What could we do with it? Like how can we play a move given such a neural network? So we are in some state as T and our goal is to choose the next action AT that is somehow good and leads us to, to a winning move. So what are the ingredients? The tree search and the neural <coughs> network. The neural network is a function of the state and it puts out two quantities. A probability distribution over all actions that are possible. Probability distribution means for every possible action it gives a probability. This is why it's a vector. If you have 100 possible actions, this is a 100 dimensional vector with numbers between 0 and 1 all summing up to 1. And V is the value of that state. In reinforcement learning we call the value of a state um, 
you can say the expected probability to win from that state. So if the war position, the current state is a good state from which you are likely to win, V is very close to one. Uh, if it is a bad state, you're about to lose, it should be close to zero. The neural network should, given a state, a board position, output probabilities for next actions plus the value of the current state. That's how we have designed it. And now we assume we have it. Just this, this key back is the same as you had before, is that the uh, P from A conditional on the state, or was it? Uh, that's, that's this, yes. That's this vector, okay. And then the, the, the value, is it depending on the current policy, or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It depends on so the current policy. The no, no, it's it's one network that gives you both. For for those that new reinforcement, no re reinforcement learning a little bit better. There's basically two approaches that are called policy based and value based, and usually you either model the policy directly or the value function. This is a combined thing. You have one neural network. It gives you the next action, so it encodes a policy plus the value of the state in one single network. Good, and it's parameterized by theta. These are the weights of the neural network for those who knew neural networks already. This thing is good for intuition, what I call the gut feeling. You give it a state and it says, oh, I think you should do this and I'm quite sure you will win. That's the idea of the neural network. This, this is what it is good for. So then we have the tree search. It's called a Monte Carlo tree search. Yeah. This, yeah. How do you get the value? From the neural network. We will know it in 20 minutes. We, 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 have, to, like, we have to do it in some, some order. Um, for the moment, we just assume the neural network knows how to estimate the value. We'll later see how we get there. We will see it in detail. How do you deal with illegal moves like moves that you just cannot make? Um, that's included in the simulation. Like you, you have to have some model that knows the game rules and it will enforce it. No, it's model-based reinforcement learning. You have a simulation of Go that basically uh, tells you, you you cannot do this move. It does not do anything else. It just knows the rules. If you give it the rules of chess, it will learn chess. OK, Monte Carlo tree search. Um, what is it? It is directly this search of, I am here in that state. I look, what, other act what actions could I do? These hundreds of, of things I could do. And you look for each of them. What could the opponent do now? Hundreds of actions. You look, OK, if it does this, what can I do here? It's really building the search tree. And this is huge. Like we, we call in AI the branching factor, the number of actions you can choose from every state, the average number of actions. This is really high, hundreds here. So it's impossible to compute it completely. So this is why it's a Monte Carlo tree search. Monte Carlo states, um, is a synonym for the Monte Carlo casino. And, and stands for randomness. We do not um, build the whole tree. We sample the tree based on what might be a good path to follow through the tree. Um, we only explore the likely branches, like it's written here. This is good for tactics. You do not just have the gut feeling of, oh, I think I should do this from the state, what the neural network gives you. With the tree search, you can say, OK, if I do that, I will end up here. Then you can query the neural network again. What will the opponent do? I will probably do this. And what will I do then? You can query the neural network again. You will end up here. And you can, from there, be more sure how good will the state be. This is basically how it works. Um, what policy does the Monte Carlo research use after it went down and then played out and rolls it out to the end? We will see in a minute. Okay. So how, does, how, how do we choose a move? We perform a Monte Carlo tree search in which we ad hoc build the tree. Next slide is how we do that from the move we are currently in. So given we are in state ST, we want to know what to do next. We do that tree search guided by the neural network. And in the end, this tree search will put out an action that leads to the highest possible value. And then we will play that move. That move that the Monte Carlo tree search followed on most of the time. OK, you're still confused. That's OK. Becomes clearer quite soon. It's, it's just keep, keep, it, keep it open in your, in your head. It will, it will connect, I promise. Why, why doesn't this work? OK. So how do we perform the tree search? This is now first piece of, of real detail. Um, 
that, that will give you the basis for, for the move. We still assume we have the neural network that can output the um, action probabilities, this p vector, and the value. So what do we do? We are in state st, so we create a new tree. <coughs> there is some caching going on for making it faster in practice, so it can reuse stuff. It, it doesn't change the theory. We can forget about that. So we create a new tree that has just our node st here. Then what do we do? We perform, and this is a hyperparameter, 1,600 simulations. We could also do more, we could do less. It turned out for them this is a good uh, trade-off between how fast it can run and how well it turns out to be. So let's say we're doing a couple of, of simulations. What do we do in every simulation? One simulation is a traversal of the current tree until a node that we haven't, that is a leaf node, and that needs to be expanded once more. This is one simulation. So in the beginning, one simulation means we expand one node. And later it means we traverse a tree until the current last node and expand it once further. So going to a leaf and then expanding it is called a simulation. We do 1,600 of them. What do we do in each simulation? We start at the root. We traverse a tree down in a specific manner. How? We choose the action, like Nodes are board positions, and um, the, the edges between the nodes are the specific actions. So this tree means there's one board position I'm currently in, and there are three possible actions. Um, and the edges here, they have annotations. A Q value, that is the accumulated mean value of the following state. We will see in a minute down here how, how we come to that value. And a U value. So what does the Q and the U mean? The Q is our current estimate from the tree search how good the following tree is based on the experience we get by going down the same tree a couple of times and getting the final values at the end of the tree. Of course, in the beginning, when we start building the tree, this Q value is not very... We have actually no, no, no basis for, to, to know a good Q value. So in the beginning, this Q value is meaningless. Later on, it becomes more stable and we can rely more on it. So in the beginning, Q is meaningless. This is why we have the U value. Um, the U value comes from the notion of an upper confidence bound, who heard about it maybe, just to, 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 to connect the lines there. And there's a principle behind it that's actually very intuitive. It's called have I written it somewhere? Um, I think I didn't. It's called... It's, high it's, it's something like a prior probability. It, it basically says, act optimistically as long as you don't know much. So when we haven't explored a certain action often yet, so we haven't run down this path very often, we assume that it might be a good action. We are optimistic in the face of uncertainty because we do not know yet. So we are optimistic and assume it's good. So we choose it. We have a high U value while we haven't seen lots of simulations yet in that branch. That leads to high exploration of that branch. And when we see it more often and we see, oh, actually our optimism was meaningless, it's not a good idea, U goes down and the Q takes over, and if the Q is not high, we will not anymore explore in that direction, but explore another one. So this U value helps us to get the trade-off between exploration, we haven't seen that, so we have to explore, and exploitation, we know that this one is already good, so go down more in that direction to, to trade that off in a good way. And the principle is called optimism in the face of uncertainty. There, I, I think there is some sort of hyperparameter, but it's quite um, uh, well behaving. It's, it's not a, I, I don't have the details in, in mind, but it's not something that uh, it breaks down if you don't get it right to the, to the tenth of a percent or so. Okay, so in the beginning, when we do not know nothing, Q values are low, U values are high everywhere, so we basically randomly choose an action. If we then, 
then see that this action actually didn't deserve our trust, we will abandon it and go more into the direction where we get higher Q values. So this is how the tree search works. We traverse a tree based on the Q and U that guides what directions we take in every step until we arrive at a leaf node where there's nothing more to traverse. What do we do then? We expand the tree. How? I mean, we do not know the value of, of that and what happens now. Now our gut feeling approximator comes into play, the neural network. So in that state S where we arrived, for example here, we query our neural network with that S and ask, okay, neural network, what do you think is the value of that state that actually will give us the Q values? And what do you think, which action should we take? A prior probability on which actions might be, might be interesting. So we get that from the neural network and we expand by adding all possible actions, all non-zero actions here and the resulting nodes, board positions. And we initialize the four numbers that we uh, maintain for every node. The number of times we visited that node in our search of course, at the beginning, it's zero. We have never been down to that node before, so it's zero. We actually um, initialize the W. The W is the total value of the next state, so the sum of all the V values in the path down until there. It's also zero because it's the lowest node yet. The Q value is also zero because we just initialized it. And the prior probability of that action that led to one of the nodes which is the entry of that p-vector for the action we took. So now we have expanded the tree and we start over until we have 1,600 such rollouts. Ah, sorry, no, we don't start over. When we have expanded the tree, we will back up the values up the tree for all the nodes in the path from the root to the, to the nodes we just added we count up the wizard counter, add up the total sum of the values of the state in the path, we add the new one, and we normalize the Q value, which is just the total uh, value divided by the number of visited, we visited it. So this is how we arrive at the, at the, at the values of the Q, the Q values of each node. We don't know yet how we arrive, how the neural network arrives at the V. But we will see. For yes? Every simulation, is the, 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 the query to the neural network done only once? For every simulation, the query to the neural network is only done at the, big, at the leaf. At the end of the yeah, day. only at the leaf. We only need it there to basically get the information we do not know yet. Mm -hmm. So how, 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 how do you handle that of the tree to begin with? It's implicitly given by these, you do 1,600 simulations, depending on how many branches you have and how likely several of them are. Like, if only one action makes sense in many of the, of the states, you can go down there very deep. If all the actions make sense, you will expand more paths and they will all be quite shallow. So this is somehow dynamic. Um, your look ahead is basically the, how many levels in the tree do you have at the end. If you only follow one action until very late, you will have a very narrow but long look ahead. If you follow many actions on the first couple of levels, you will have a very broad but shallow look ahead. And it's, never, it's nowhere defined. Like It's not like looking ahead 10, uh, 10 moves. It's looking ahead 1,600 simulations, whatever that means. Okay, Thomas? Uh, I was uh, having the same question whether um, how many levels you go down. Because if you imagine that you start playing the game, mm -hmm. then you would know probably, uh, probabilistically uh, what the first move will be, and that will obviously heavily influence the structure of the tree. And the question is on how much tree you keep in memory, essentially, and how many leaves uh, you have. because. Uh, way you tell us um, there's no way to foresee and how big uh, the tree will eventually get uh, at the expansion. Exactly. I mean, you, you do these 1,600 runs until leave, and at every run you will expand 
one leaf. But depending on how broad you go, it will be less deep. Um, and all this has to be kept in memory. And actually, they do some caching stuff to reuse in the next move parts of the tree from the last simulation to not have to compute the same stuff again. And, and it will give you less long look ahead, less tactics, yes. Fun? And the U is updated as well, or is it a constant? Um, the U is computed from the, the wizard count and the Q. So the U is a compute. I, I didn't bring the formula because it, it basically, you have to go much more into depth to exactly understand how the U is uh, calculated. But it's calculated from the wizard count and from the, from the value. And it has a discount factor in it and basically trades off how often have you seen it and how sure you can be about the value then. If you haven't seen it often, you do not trust the queue. If you have visited it often, you trust it completely. That's basically the trade-off. OK, this is how the tree search works. We don't know yet how the neural network is brought to a state where it can give reliable predictions. This just tells us how to use the neural <coughs> network and to do some look ahead. OK, we go forth. How do we train the, the neural network that will give you both the policy and the value? Um, so first, we have to know how to create training data. And this is um, done by using the current policy network that we have. And in the beginning, that means we have an initially random, randomly initialized neural network. So this is a bootstrapping approach. For all those familiar with machine learning, you are used to it. <laughs> for all those for whom this is new, this is what machine learning people do. You have to, to start somewhere, and you start randomly, and start using it, and it will improve over time. But you initially put some trust in something from which you know with certainty that it's not a good idea to trust it. And it will work out. OK, so we initialize our neural network randomly. So it will take in a state. It will issue a value and, and a um, uh, probability over actions from the state. But you basically know in the beginning it doesn't make much sense. Now it maybe makes sense to look quickly on how the state really is represented. Actually, what they give in is this. 19 by 19 grids, the board positions, basically for the black stones, and not only the current board position, but the last seven board positions as well from, for black. The same for white, only the white stones, and the last seven positions with white, only white stones. So we have some sort of notion of history. And another layer that is all black or all white and indicates whose turn it is at the moment. This together is the game state that is fed into the neural network. You can think of it as an image with 19 by 19 pixels and 14, 15, 16, and 17 layers. 17 correct? Yeah, it's correct. Okay, cool. I can do math. Yay. Okay, so we now have a neural network. It's not good in the beginning. It's randomly initialized, but we have it so we can use it. It will output a correct, uh, syntac syntactically correct result. What do we do with it? Okay, we play 25,000 games against <coughs> ourselves. Meaning we use the neural network to play. And 25,000 is, of course, again, a hyperparameter. It can be more, then it computes longer, and it's better. You can less, then it's slower, but, uh, faster, but worse. 25,000. How do we do it? So we start a game. I don't know, black starts or white? Usually black starts, right? OK, one of the colors starts. <coughs> how, how does it pick a move? It gives the current position to the neural network. No, not to the neural network, to Monte Carlo Tree Search, as we saw it on the last slide. And back comes the action with the highest visit count. This is the one that should be played. So when this action is played, White is on turn, takes the same neural network, takes a new board position, gives it to the Monte Carlo tree search that is applying the neural network basically to find the best action, gives back the action that was visited the most time on the, on the top layer of the search, gives back the new state to black, which is doing Monte Carlo tree search on the new state, and so forth. So we start with the first state, we get back an action distributed after what the neural network says, so which we can call the policy, get back the new state uh, board position, do the tree search, get back the, the, the visit counts, pick the, choose the action based on that probability distribution, and so forth. 
when the game is finished, we get the result from the game. If black won or if black lost. And here it's of course uh, good that there is no draw state. It's either black won or black lost. And for white it's vice versa. When we have done that 25,000 times, we have collected a lot of stuff. We have collected board positions with probability distributions over the best action and the final reward. Plus that ends up being the value of that board position. Like if we know here we win in the end, then we know the value of this position is quite good. If we lose in the end, we know the value is worse. Yeah? We come to mini batches soon. This is just data collection. So, so we, we so you update until yet we didn't update anything. We used the randomly initialized thing, played 25,000 games until the end, and collected all the data. Meaning we collected tuples of game states, probability distributions over actions, and final result. Okay. Yeah, Elvis. Raul, you're asking in the beginning is the um, is it deterministic or, or probabilistic? During the training phase, like here, we do it probabilistic. We get a distribution over actions and we probabilistically choose an action according to this distribution. Which means not always that m most likely action will be, will be picked, but most likely the most likely one will be picked. <laughs> Warm it. Uh, ah, we play it to the end. And then we see who has won. Then, like, and this result we take. Then you update the values. Right? You need to go back and update uh, that is what we will see on the next slide, yes. Until now, we just collect who has won. And the states and action. Oliver? It's just one network. So each player has another network. Right? At the moment, it's just one network. Just this F that we have just init uh, randomly initialized. So we're still playing 25,000 games completely at random against ourselves and collect the data. When we have done that 25,000 times, we can actually start training the neural network. Well, it will turn out good with the time. So, retraining is the next thing we do. How does retraining work? First, we do something that DeepMind already did in Atari games, which is called uh, experience replay. That means we sample from the last 500,000 self-play games, 2,048 board positions. Why do we sample from 500,000, only 2,048, to basically break this dependency of board positions from on, on the previous ones? So we can regard them as being identically um, uh, independent and identically distributed. And what we then do is basically just supervised learning. No reinforcement learning at all. We're just doing supervised learning. What does it mean? We have our neural network policy, F uh, theta. We are using this batch of 2,048 board positions and ground truth is the final value who won plus what the Monte Carlo tree search put out as a move probabilities. This is our made up ground truth. State to probability distribution over actions and value. So game state is input. Output should be move probabilities. I have dropped the vector notation here because this is what machine learners do all the time. They get rid of the arrows. Um, and the value. This is what we want to have. Labels we have from here and here. These are our labels and this is our input and this should be our output. What is the loss function? It's a cross entropy, like to compare distributions between the output of the neural network and the output of the Monte Carlo tree search, plus the mean squared error between the two scalars, the actual outcome of the game and the value the neural network put out, plus a regularization on the parameters of the neural network so that it does not get crazy. F for those not familiar with machine learning, ignore the last term. It's just technicality. So we want to be the output of the neural network as close as possible to the, original, to the final outcome of the game. And we want to be the move probabilities of the neural network to be as close as possible to the wizard counts of the tree search. And this is somehow bootstrapping because also the tree search is relying on the neural network in the first place to get the move probabilities, but in the end it works. That's a nice thing. If we have done this once, we have a, better, we, we have a newly trained neural network. Now we want to know if this neural network is better than the old one. 
So we have to go to evaluation. That's actually the last phase we have to do, then we are done. So how is this new neural network evaluated? We take it and play 400 games with the currently newly trained neural network against our last best one. How do we do it? For each player, we use Monte Carlo tree search <coughs> with each of the networks. Uh, like black, for example, uses the current best network and white uses the newly trained one. Both used Monte Carlo tree search with their network that um, gives the action which, which one should do. We play deterministically, so we then always take the action that has the highest probability. We're not choosing actions according to a distribution, we're picking the best one for evaluation. And then we check if the newly trained network is wins 55 or more percent of the games. If it wins more than half of the games, we think it's better than the old one in 400 games. We get rid of the old one and we replace our current best network with the one we just trained. And then we go back to here. We create more training experience. After 25,000 games, we retrain the network. Um, and after we have retrained the network, we play 400 games against the last one and see which one is better and replace it. Yes? This step is really new compared to normal training procedure. Normally you never go back to the... You always take the new updated... That's, that's also, I think, a trick that DeepMind already had in the Atari versions. They had this experience replay to break up the dependency of the samples on each other. And another thing they called the target network. Of course, there they did Q-learning, but they always used an older version of the network in estimation, the value, and the newest version in playing, mm -hmm. because it will mess up with, uh, with the theory behind it. And here, it's basically something similar. But if you only take the best one, in, in the normal, yes. normal Atari game, you just took the last one. Exactly. It's, 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 it's a new take on that. Yeah. Yeah. And it gets biased, I guess. I mean. No. no. But it works. So, to wrap it up, uh, so we basically saw, you can believe me, maybe you don't have the feeling yet, but you saw everything that is needed to implement the stuff and it will run. In the slides, I think, Beate, you always already have it on your, on your website, uh, you even have in the appendix uh, some pseudocode to implement it. And it's a one-pager, the pseudocode. So it's really easy. Uh, you have tree search. You have training of a neural network, you have that evaluation, that's it. Start from scratch and learn from self-play. Does it work well also in other games like chess or is it just... It works yeah. very good probably. also in chess and in shogi. Okay. With the same network architecture, the same hyperparameters, not changing anything. Yeah. It, it can do that because the, the current state only sees the last seven moves, right? But the, uh, the outlook using the tree search can be longer than seven moves. So it actually turned out to not only beat the world champion that look ahead, I don't know, 20 or 30 moves, but I think this is what I read somewhere. But um, it also came up with completely new strategies, long-term strategies, that the professional Go players have never seen in the 3,000 years of history of the game. So basically, the, the world champion was like, I never saw that, and it looks genius. Uh. But it's only because you use the neural network to get the d-values uh, in the multicolor research. Because otherwise, it would have uh, you know, the feedback to the network. Yeah, it's a combination. Yeah. You need the tree search to really guide your strategy and not do just gut feeling thinking that is short-sighted. And so you need the search and you need the neural network so to make the search feasible and concentrate on what might, might be a good thing. What I want to give those that have or have not heard, so basically every one of you, um, is some pointers towards when you read other reinforcement learning stuff. Because I think this stuff is so close to standard supervised learning that it's quite good graspable. But if you read other reinforcement learning stuff, there are lots of concepts that interact. 
For example, the formal framework for all reinforcement learning stuff here as well is a Markov decision process. So if you read that somewhere, this is also a Markov decision process that you want to learn. Um, we here act on perfect information states and not just finite sized observations that do not give you the complete state, so this is easy. We are doing something called planning based on a model. So basically we're doing model-based reinforcement learning. We have the model of the, state of the game with which we can simulate. This is how it is trained, right? Um, and we do so-called prediction and control. We evaluate our policy and we use it to actually act. Um, we have a value function, not explicitly, separately, but our neural network gives out a value. So we learn that together with the policy. This is something that usually separated. Um, so you cannot say this is a value-based approach or it's a policy-based approach. It's somehow a combined approach. Um, and we use Monte Carlo simulation in the tree search with a something that is within reinforcement learning used also in other contexts. This randomness to, to somehow sample instead of doing everything. Yes? Is there, like in convolutional learning, uh, the same thing that you do with images, say a cat, <coughs> Show me what the what, what is the strategy? What does the, the opponent want to uh, get a cluster and kind of uh, visualize that and you know learn from that, or is the algorithm or the, the network strategy deeply based? I I haven't I haven't seen any like visualization of the weights to get out a strategy, but what I've seen in the papers from DeepMind is that they actually devote a whole section and images on. Um, in the paper to show basically specific moves and strategies with which the, um, the system came up and also strategies it developed early on in training and then abandoned and came up with new ones. So basically in the beginning it really plays strategies that human beginners play and then it uh, forgets them and comes up with strategies that grandmasters play and forgets them and comes up with new strategies that no human has ever seen but are very successful. And then it combines them with uh, successful human strategies. Yes? Um, how much computing power would you need to estimate to run such an algorithm as Capital Play and Go? Like, it can be run on a single machine in basically real time. That's not yeah. a problem. The training is what takes long. I think they train it for. for what you want to do should be more than one alpha <laughs> <laughs> I think the Alpha Zero is much faster. It's not like the Alpha Go. I, I think they, play, they trained it on a single machine in 40 days. There's uh, actually an open source project called uh, Lila Go, or no, Lila Zero, which kind of tries to do distributed training, because otherwise, if you're not Google, you cannot train. And they came out with this number, which is like, pretty large. And they are like, I think, 70 to 90 times as well. Can you say the number again? Millions. Millions of years on a single machine. They, they, they use the TPUs, the, the spe uh, specific tensor processing hardware. I think they use like maybe 6 and 4 TPU units and the 200 TPUs, but with the Python A, it's basically impossible. I'm actually, prob probably Eli is right, but I'm not sure. I haven't read it. I just know it's 40 times faster than the old AlphaGo. But the old AlphaGo was very hardware intensive. So, Mohamed, you had a question as well? Yes. Um, and in this case, if you at the end of the game do a supervised learning and say all the states were bad and distribute the final results of the game through all the states, then you will not learn proper information, I would say. 
theoretically maybe, but it turns out it works. Maybe because of um, that it gains so much experience in playing. Yes. Maybe you have to explain to the rest what Mohamed means with evolution is this final evaluation step where you basically pitch the old network and the new one and see which one actually performs better. This is a sort of an evolutionary selection process where you just see if what you just learned is actually competitive or not. Sure. The, the value of the first state is not, not very meaningful. Yeah, but that's what you do by distributing the entire result of the game through the old state. The but that's actually a typical thing in reinforcement learning that you have the so-called credit assignment problem. You get delayed rewards in games. It's, it's um, as worse as possible, as bad as possible. You play all these moves, can be hundreds of them, and in the end you get a final result and you have to propagate that to... How do you do it to everything? And they solve it by saying, okay, we propagate it to every step. Mm -hmm. And it somehow seems to work in the overall setting with everything together. And I think there's also this kind of factor that in uh, states that are near the current state, like the, the reward is like, say, bigger than... Usually you have it, but here, here not. Yes, I think I have it in the appendix somewhere. So this, you cannot read it from here, but if you download the slides, you can see it. This is a neural network, uh, convolutional layers m mainly, yes. I mean, it, the state is encoded image-like, so you can basically use an image-like convolutional neural network. Um, there was a final slide, but I think it's not so super important. You have seen basically how it works. If you go over the three main slides again. That's actually everything you need to know how it's implemented. The rest is, is like maybe speed up details and so on. This is the learning system. And it's pr actually very principled. There are no fancy tweaks to it. There are not many hyperparameters. It's basically supervised learning combined with the tree search. Um, I think it warrants their excitement. Uh, like uh, it, it, it's really an exciting thing. And I, I think Google was not just financing this uh, because they wanted to, to, to have the best Go program. Uh, so it's, it will be interesting to see where, where, it's, where else it is applicable. Yes, yes. The, the best node is in the end the one with the highest n. Yeah. So basically, here you see, we see the, this uh, uh, um, policy that comes out of the tree. This is a, 